Fertility journey is a winding road of hope and despair. It's not linear, it's not predictable. Roughly one in six couples in Canada experience infertility, and our own Pooja Honda is here today to share her own personal experience with this. Pooja, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so glad I get to talk to you about this. Well, I'm just happy that you feel safe in this space to have this conversation. I didn't know anything about your journey. And I think a lot of viewers will be able to take a lot from it. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, I, I've never spoken about it uh, publicly before. And I think for a lot of people, they may be able to relate to that. It's a, it's a hard topic to actually talk about. Um, I think there's just so many questions and there's so many vulnerabilities, but I think it's time to talk about it and I finally feel like I'm ready. Uh, for, for me, it started at the age of 34. Uh, my husband and I, we, we got married and we knew we wanted to have kids. It's the one thing that I've always known about myself is that I've always wanted to be a mom. Uh, so we started right away and we tried to get pregnant. It didn't work naturally. Mm -hmm. Tried that for a year, and then we thought, okay, let's just go make sure everything's okay. There's nothing wrong. So we went to a fertility clinic, did a bunch of tests. Uh, they tested him. They tested me. Everything came back normal, and sort of the diagnosis was, like, there should be no reason why you can't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. So we started with something called IUI, which is where they, they sort of time your cycle, and then, you know, when, when you're ovulating, they inseminate you, and they just make sure that, you know, everything's sort of happening on time. We tried that a few times, didn't work, mm -hmm. and then we moved on to IVF. And uh, the way IVF works is that they retrieve your eggs and then they fertilize them with your partner's sperm mm -hmm. and then you create embryos. The reason why I'm giving you that background is because we created a lot of embryos uh, in my journey and none of them worked. So we tried the first transfer, didn't work. Second transfer, didn't work. Mm -hmm. And with every transfer I did, I started to have a reaction to some of the medications I was on. So then I'd have to have surgery because of the medications. And then it just kept happening. So we would try, it wouldn't work, I'd have surgery. We'd try again, it wouldn't work, I'd have surgery. Oh my goodness, Pooja. So how many, how many transfers are we talking about here? So seven rounds of IVF uh -huh. and 11 transfers over the course of seven years and that includes two clinics in the u.s and three clinics here in canada and again everybody telling us that we should be able to get pregnant and mm -hmm. it just didn't happen and and we literally tried everything from acupuncture to chinese medicine uh, i went into early menopause they put me on drugs to put me into menopause hoping that would sort of restart the body and, and maybe we could have implantation that way. Yeah. None of it worked. Okay, so you're, you're telling me this, you're telling me every time you went in, then you're having surgery, the whole time this is happening, you're on TV. Yes. You're showing up for work every day, you're doing this, you're smiling. Mm -hmm. Tell me what that was like. How do you get your head in the game and, in, in order to do this and you're not talking about it with anybody? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think in many ways work was the best distraction because mm -hmm. I could come to work and you know you do this, you have to be so focused on what you're doing, you have to be present, you have to be there. Yeah. Of course, all this is happening in the background and I think for a long time I sort of swept it under the rug and just pretended like it wasn't happening so that I could do my job. Mm -hmm. um, that caught up with me and I eventually did take some time off work. I went to go see someone, uh, I saw a psychologist just Good. to make sure that you know, I was dealing with it uh, properly. Yeah. Uh, and I think I learned in that process that I really had to sit in it. I had to sit in the sadness. Uh, I had to sit in the fact that, you know, this wasn't happening for me the way it happens for my friends, for people where it happens so easily. Uh, and be okay with that. And I think the more I did that, the more I had conversations with friends about baby showers and it being uncomfortable for me having to go because it was just too hard to watch or even to be around babies. Sometimes it was really hard for me to be able to have those conversations and just tell people I'm not okay, um, I think was really freeing. And it helped eventually to realize that everybody goes through hard things and uh, everybody has something. This yeah. is my thing. Uh, and you know, you find a way, you find a way to get out of bed, go to work, and be hopeful and be grateful as well because I think 
I started to really think about my journey and I had so much to be grateful for, but I also was privileged in being able to have that many tries. I could afford to do seven rounds of IVF. You know, not everybody has that privilege. So I really tried to focus on, on the good things. So there's a reason why we're talking about this now. Because there, there's, there's a light at the end of this story, right? Yes. So talk to me about where you are right now in the journey. So uh, at the end of June, uh -huh. my husband and I are expecting a baby girl <gasps> via surrogate. I didn't know the gender. <laughs> yes, it's oh a girl. Gosh. Yes. That is incredible. What, was that, what has that process been like? And how did you decide that that was the route you were going to go? Well, I think, you know, after trying everything we possibly could, uh, you know, we really were left with very little choices, yeah. but we knew we wanted a family no matter what, whatever that looked like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've also learned in this process, there are so many ways to have a family and yeah. there's no right or wrong way. And I really had to sort of accept that this was my journey and, and this is where we are. So uh, surrogacy was something that uh, we looked into with the help of my doctor, Dr. Sharma. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's agencies that can help you find a surrogate. We ended up finding one through a friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went through the agency, though. And it works a little different in Canada than it does in the U.S., where in Canada, you can't pay a surrogate to, oh, okay. to carry your child. Uh, you have to pay for their expenses. So it becomes, the reason why that's important is it becomes really something that, you know, is, is very altruistic. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's signing up to do this for you is not doing it for the money. Right. You know, they're doing it to give you a family. It's a really, really special thing, and it takes a really special person to want to even be a surrogate. What's that relationship like? Because you're right, you're in this situation where this person is giving you a gift that you have been waiting for for so many years. Um, are you in constant contact with the surrogate? Are you allowed to be? Is it friendly? Is it like family? How does it work? Oh my goodness, I was so worried about that relationship yeah. because you're going in with blind faith. You hope, is this person going to treat my baby as if it was their own baby? Are they going to eat well? Are they going to have their mm. vitamins? Are we going to get along? Like, yeah. how is that all going to happen? And I think the starting point is that you're dealing with someone who is a very good person to begin with, yes. right? They're a giving, loving person. So. Uh, that was the first part is, you know, you start to develop that trust. My surrogate and I, we talk every day. Wow. Uh, we've developed a really, really great friendship. Yeah. And all the ideas I had about, oh, my goodness, are we going to keep in touch? Am I going to tell my future baby about her? All the things that I, I wasn't sure about, I absolutely now know that this is so special that... Yeah. Of course, I'm going to talk about it. Of course, we're going to be in touch forever. I think they're going to be a part of my child's life yeah. for sure. Uh, just because it's it's a beautiful thing for women to help women in this way. Yes, it's a gift that I, I don't. How could I ever, you know, show my appreciation? I don't think there's anything I could do to say thank you for for such a huge gift. Oh my gosh, I love this story. <laughs> I'm just, I'm so happy it's ending this way yes. or beginning this way. It's almost like a whole new beginning. Pooja, thank you so much for sharing your story. The conversation isn't over. So you mentioned your uh, doctor. Mm -hmm. So she is with us as well. We're going to be joined by Pooja's fertility specialist to dive deeper into surrogacy and the other options out there for couples dealing with fertility issues because I know you are listening. So stay with us. So excited for <laughs> you. Oh, my God. Welcome back, everyone. Before the break, Pooja shared with us the story of her journey to start a family. After seven years and 11 failed embryo transfers, she is now expecting a baby through a surrogate. We're so happy. <laughs> We're joined now by Pooja's fertility doctor, Dr. Prati Sharma. So, Dr. Sharma, how common is Pooja's situation for folks watching at home? It's, I imagine it's fairly prevalent. Yeah, I mean... First off, I say every patient's journey is unique. And when I see patients, I always try to apply a patient-centered approach, look at their individualized story. However, you are correct. Pooja's incredible journey, and thank you so much for sharing this and bringing a topic that's absolutely so important to the limelight. Mm -hmm. It is common. I see second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth opinions almost every day in my office of patients who do repetitive IVF cent uh, cycles. They go to multiple centers, they see multiple physicians, and they're still not there yet. Mm -hmm. And this concept of what we call in the medical world repetitive implantation failure, so the 11 failed transfers that you went through, um, 
you know, women just want to keep trying. It's in their nature to be successful, and yeah. they feel like conceiving and having a pregnancy in their uterus is really the only way to experience the whole cycle of pregnancy and being a parent. And so it's natural, and rightfully so. They continue to try IVF and embryo transfers in an effort to get to their end point. So I do see this story a lot in my practice. Now, were you the one, Dr. Sharma, that gently led Pooja and Paul towards the surrogacy route? I think it was a partnership. Yeah. We talked about your story quite extensively. Um, I reviewed all of her previous cycles. Yeah. Um, and what I really saw this as was a, a couple who really tried everything. They went to the ends of the earth to make sure they saw the best doctors, got the best care, did every possible treatment out there to make it happen. But what I saw with Pooja's story and also pa patients like this is that Time passes, and all of a sudden, it's seven years later, 11 transfers later, and you're still at the beginning. And so I really try to talk to patients, and I think I tried to do the same with Pooja and Paul, and said, what is your goal here? In the end, you want to start a family. You want to have a child, and there are many ways to have a family, and I think it's time right now that we kind of look outside the box, and we say, let's look at surrogacy. Let's see if this is going to be the right path for you, and if it's the right time to move on, and say, let's get this moving and have our family now. See, I think that's an incredible part of the story because sometimes you do need someone to suggest something a little out of the box that you would not have necessarily gone to. Mm -hmm. right. So, and, and what's beautiful about um, doctors like you is you have like a playbook of options. Yes. Are there, other, are there any other options you would suggest to couples um, or families that might be in the same situation as Pooja? Yeah, so when I see a couple, and this is really the thing that draws me to this field of reproductive medicine, it's really a puzzle. Yeah. You put all the pieces together, you look at the male position, the female factors, and all of the testing and what they've been through, and then you establish this treatment plan. And mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of trial and error here. I mean, if you're a young couple with all normal parameters, as Pooja said in the beginning of her journey, we try fertility medication and insemination. If that fails after three to four cycles, we move on to IVF. If IVF doesn't work after a couple of cycles, then we explore things like egg donation, surrogacy. Um, so all to say that there is a playbook of options, and it's mm -hmm. all about how far the patient wants to go, what seems reasonable, and what's going to fit their individualized case. Now, Pooja, when you talked about, you talk about Dr. Sharma, like, you're a big fan. Yes. <laughs> and you say <laughs> that, and, and I get it, you say, and it's not just about her suit. Like, she's no, she really good great too. <laughs> at what she does. So you say that she gave you access like no other doctor, and mm -hmm. you did work with other doctors. So I did. how much yeah. of a difference did that make, the access that she gave you? You know, there are people right now who are watching your show who are sitting in a waiting room, and they're waiting for an ultrasound and blood work, and they've been poked and prodded mm -hmm. and you know it's so much it, the medications and you start to feel like a number and even though you're sitting in a room with a bunch of other women who you know are going through the exact same thing as you you feel so alone and you feel like my body is broken I'm my body's not doing what it's supposed to do and I think with Dr. Sharma I felt like she really saw me as as a person as a human before anything else and she prides herself on on, on patient, patient care it's one of the first things we talked about and having access knowing that if there was any questions if anything was going on or if I was having even just you know a moment of like what are we doing here I could reach out to her and I was going to get a response and I didn't feel like a number. I felt like, you know, I was somebody that she cared about and, you know, I I think we're we're going to go on to be friends too. I hope so. <laughs> I really do hope so. Yes. She's telling you it's happening. Yeah, we're going to be friends. No choice now. <laughs> you probably have a, so many friends no, built up no, from no. this from this business because you you're playing such a crucial role in people's lives. That's an emotional connection yeah. right there, right? Well, mm -hmm. I always say when patients quote graduate and they leave yes. my practice at 12 weeks, I feel like I'm losing a friend. So the fact yes. that you're saying that we'll remain friends is really it warms my heart so I couldn't be happier well speaking of uh, you know continuing the, the the good cheer and the positivity uh, Pooja you've really gone all in uh, with this because of your journey and your experience you've decided that you are gonna try and help other couples how are you doing that oh my goodness so that really really helps I think with everything that I've been through part of the process was also knowing that there is purpose to all of this and that's to one day talk about it normalize the conversation normalize surrogacy normalize other ways 
to start a family, but also to help couples who maybe feel like this is just not even accessible to me. I can't afford it. Yes. I can't even look at it. And I don't think affordability should be a reason why people can't start a family. So I've partnered with Modern Miracle Foundation. They're a brand new charity. They just launched in February, became a registered charity. And what they do is they help with fertility treatments. They help fund your treatments, whatever that might be that you need. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a certain criteria you need to become eligible, but yeah. something in place where you can donate, by the way, to Modern Miracle Foundation, you can look them up, and help other couples who are in a similar situation but don't have the options that I had where I could afford to have a surrogate or to go through multiple rounds. Absolutely. Okay, I'm so happy that you gave us that information because, as I mentioned, so many viewers will be watching. Dr. Sharma, you're brilliant. I'm so Thank happy you. for Pooja and Paul. And you know, this opens you up to a whole different level of segments on City Line, Pooja. Oh, great. <laughs> now it's like we're going to be with Mom, Pooja. And tell us about how this is going and how that is going. And I it's going to be awesome. I cannot wait. One thing I did promise is that if, if we ever were blessed enough to have a baby, I would never complain. <laughs> Well, let's see how that goes. We'll bring the baby to yeah. the show. Mini Pooja. Yeah. Oh, show. We'll, we'll see how sweet. that one goes. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> That's really sweet. Thank you so much for sharing the story um, and sharing all this great information for our viewers. We appreciate it.